right, so back from vacation. You're back from vacation, yeah. Yeah, and it was good. Went to Nashville, got to eat some good southern food and... See your family. Yeah, I got to see my family. Yeah. that And then if I say I'm eating southern food, that means I got to see my family. <laughs> okay, all right. It's like... Gotta, Those two things kind of go hand in hand. You gotta keep up with the. the Ma- Mari got to see the cousins and all that, so that's good. But we're back, and so we're back now. Yeah, getting back at it. Yeah. And we're, what's on What's on tap today? So you want me to dive right into it? I got yeah. I got, an, I got an article I sent you, but um, oh, this is the uh, Anglican guy. Yeah, so this is just from a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I'll I'll just dive into it. Yeah, so this is the Church of England Anglican guy. He's an Archbishop. Well, he says the Lord's Prayer opening may be problematic. He says so the, Lord, the Lord's <laughs> Prayer opening meaning the words what? So he says it may be problematic because of their patriarchal association. He has a problem with saying so our, our the, Father. Our Father who art in heaven. Those opening words. Okay. So our Father who art in heaven may be problematic because because why? Because of patriarchal associations. Here, there, there's a quote I wanted to read. Mm-hmm. He says, I know the word father is problematic for those whose ex- experience of earthly fathers has been destructive or abusive, and for all of us who have labored rather too much from an oppressively patriarchal grip on life. So okay. there's, there's a lot there. Well, I mean, he's, he's right. <laughs> that we haven't had good earthly fathers? Yeah, and th- therefore he's right that the words our father may be problematic for individuals. Yeah. But he's going further than that, not just ad- acknowledging they're, that they're problematic. Well, where do you think he's going then? In February... Does he, want to, does he want to change it? Is that where he's going? In February, the Church of England said it would consider whether to stop referring to God as he after priests asked to be allowed to use gender-neutral terms instead. Like what? What gender-neutral terms would you use for God? It... Well, that's all, that's all we have in English. It. Really. Or are they going to start saying, like, Z? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Instead of E. You, you, you laugh, and it is kind of... It, I find more and more I read stuff like this, and it almost reads like satire. It does. It, it, like, okay, so you do get to a point where you become your own parody. Yeah. They get it. And it's, you know... So when do you like okay let's let's pretend like we're not Christian for a minute. Like, right. Let's let's pretend like we're Muslims you and me. All right. Okay. Like at what point do you look at western Christianity? Cuz we have to say western Christianity here, right? Because nobody in the African church is saying that praying our father is going to be problematic. Nobody in the Middle East is saying praying no, our father. No, nobody in the Eastern Orthodox Church, which hasn't changed much for no, no, no centuries. In, no Indian Christians or Chinese Christians are sitting there going, well, it might be problematic for us to say our father. It's just Western Christianity. Like, at what point, though, do you look as someone from outside at Western Christianity and you just determine that Christianity is a lie and is not true because of guys like this archbishop who become a parody of themselves like that's a that's a question in my mind because you can say well he doesn't represent all of the church because he doesn't clearly he doesn't no but at the same time he's an archbishop in in the church that was associated with a colonial enterprise that at one point was the british empire which had a full quarter of the world's population under their control. The sun never set. Right. So at what point then do you... I mean, this guy's obviously influential. And it's like... But I also kind of wonder, too... I mean, obviously, you, you can go... Okay, you can go lots of different ways. You can talk about how the world infiltrates the church mm-hmm. and that this is obviously... Because that's the point. That when I say that this is Western Christianity, this is an exp- this is a problem for Western Christians. I really do mean that. This is a problem only for people who are trying to be Christians in the middle of what we call Western society. Okay, yep. Western cultures. Again, it's not a problem for people who are Christians in other parts of the world. This is unique to Europe and North America. This is a. This is a. I mean, you know, you, the joke is white people problems. This is a white people problem. Well, and it's a response to the various different social and cultural, worldly things that are going on in Western societies. And it's a, it's, a, it's a response to pop psychology. Yes. 
I mean, even which if you is one went of those to, factors, even yeah, if absolutely. you went to a decent psychologist, they'd be like, okay, you had a crappy father. A lot of people do. Let's talk about that. But they wouldn't say because you had a crappy father. Now, now I'm sure there's some psychologists out there that would. But if if a counselor is worth their salt, they're they're going to. They're not going to say, well, because you had a bad childhood with a father, you should avoid any words of he, him, our father. They're not going to tell you that that's the way to go about life. So in other words, this is a uniquely Western expression of trying to deal with these problems. The other thing, too, is that I do wonder with, with people like this archbishop, their church is shrinking, dwindling fast. He's influential, but he's not influential like he would have been in the 19th century in England, right? Yes. Is this is this like what you know? B list actors when suddenly they they come out as gay or bi, and it gets them five more minutes of press headlines. Wh- it, whatever it becomes. So I, I don't know the get, be like, look, gay, look, gay or bi is a side hustle, but whatever the side hustle is that draws well, attention look to them again. Look, yeah. look at me and pay attention to me <laughs> yes. again, so that I can so that I can have influence. And Somehow be I feel relevant and yes. right. Yeah, I mean, I wonder sometimes with guys like this because that's a lot of pressure to be what, relevant. What, what's in my mind with it a little bit is the shifting sand kind of metaphor. Going back to what you said about let's imagine that we're not Christian. Yeah, and you said Muslim maybe or. I'm thinking even maybe somebody that's just trying to figure out existentially, figure out life, where they fit in the cosmos, fit in the universe. Yeah. And they're looking to Western Christianity for an answer. I don't know why and, you would look to this form of Western Christianity well, but, for an answer. Because but, you could just go to a psychologist and get somebody telling you, oh, it's so bad that you had a bad child. Well, but just like, bear with me for a second. Like, okay. Imagine you were looking at it and you're like, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dabble a little bit in Lutheranism. I'm going to dabble a little bit in Methodism. I'm going to dabble a little bit in the Church of England. I'm kind of trying to figure out what seems like it makes, what makes sense. Mm-hmm. How could you not come away with... Well, this all just seems like it's shifting sand, and I don't really have anything to hold on to that seems tangible. Well, look, there's a there's an old uh, there's an old sort of I guess it's a cliche amongst Roman Catholics. They talk about what are you gonna like when Catholics have a problem with Roman Catholicism, and they're like, well, maybe I'll I'll leave, you know. And then they're like, well, where are you gonna go? Are you gonna go hang out in the wasteland of Protestantism? <laughs> like, I mean, but this is the reason why because Protestants don't have one unified belief system. Protestants are a, are a are a myriad group of a bunch of different uh, tribes who all have a, just a slightly different take. And so, you talk about Lutheranism, Baptist, Methodist, whatever, non denom Like, where would you go? <laughs> It's tough to be a Protestant. It's not for weak people to be a Protestant <laughs> because you can't just fall back on this idea of, well, Mother Church. You know, Church what I mean? says so, and so now I've got to say right. what it is. And there's something that's comforting about that, but it's also wrong. Yes, I mean that's it's demonstrably wrong. Throughout history, it's demonstrably wrong to just fall back on Mother Church. But there's something comforting about the idea that I wouldn't have to learn how to think for myself, you know, and somebody could just tell me. Um, but when you got a guy like this up there in the pulpit, it's like, well, what are you being taught? It, where's the, so here's a good question. Here's a good Lutheran question. And it really is a Lutheran question. Where's the Jesus in that? So, you uh, know what I mean? Like, I've got another quote to it, share. In, in the guy who's like the, 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 our father is problematic because some people had crappy fathers. Where's the Jesus in that? Yeah. I mean, I thought you were going to go, like, where, where, where's the backstop? Where does it stop about what kinds of things you question about what the Bible says? I don't, and, think, yeah. I don't think for Protestants, Protestants should ever be afraid of questions. I don't think for Protestants, Protestants should ever be afraid of questions because... Agreed. We need to remember that the Lutheran Church started as a university movement. You know yes. what I mean? Like, it didn't start in, <laughs> in a church. It started in a university for a reason. And I don't... I don't think that Protestants should ever, of any stripe, should ever be afraid of questions. I think the what you should be concerned about is whether or not you're asking a, a good question that gets you to a good answer. And when you ask a poor question, it'll oftentimes lead to a poor answer. So the question he's asking is, what do we do for, for people who have had a bad childhood and have suffered at the hands of an abusive father? Okay, that may be a relevant question. I think it absolutely is a relevant question, but then you're... But, you're, when, you're, you, but when you run it through a filter of toxic masculinity and men are bad and 
which is where a lot of societies in the West right now are, you're going to come up with a poor answer to that question. And that's not the question to ask of the Lord's Prayer. Yes. That's a, that's a question of pastoral uh, care and uh, human care within the church as a corporate body. That's not a question that you ask of the Lord's Prayer. Well, and I like what you said about not being afraid to ask questions, but then you get, you really get into the point of what's your methodology about how and why you dive into those questions. And then for me it becomes what's the backstop for whether or not you know you're operating within a methodology that makes sense. And that's, you know, for us as Lutherans would be the sole rule and norm of faith is Scripture. Are you, are what you, is what, the way you're operating somehow backstopped by Scripture well, but he's not, that's my point. He's not asking a scriptural question about a text that comes to us from scripture. He's asking a sociological question or a psychological question about scripture. But then he's using it as a means to potentially change scripture, which means he's not using scripture as a backstop for even asking a sociological well, question. Well, he's not, he's not understanding scripture as, as the norm which norms. Yes. Like, as, as normative for how you go about your theology. And so when you ask a question that comes from psychology or possibly sociology of a scriptural text, that may not be the most helpful question to get at the text. So I'll give you an example, and I, you know, I'll get possibly crucified for saying this, depending on where people are at on a spectrum, but I feel the same way about people who ask science questions of, of Genesis. Oh, yeah. The story of creation, first of all, that God made the world, and that's the way he made it, and that's the story that we get handed down. So you got to work with that, one way or the other. How, people work with it different ways. But that's God made the world, and that's the way he made it. He spoke, and it was. There you go. Do I understand how he could do that? No. But but is that a scientific account? No. it's a Isn't it a chiastic structure in Hebrew that... You've, it's Hebrew. It's, it's Hebrew parallelism. Yeah, yeah. You've got the yeah the, the, the parallel. You know, the, the whole day thing. One, day four. And right. It's written. It's written. It's, it's written like poetry. It's not like a scientific treatise about explaining the it, science. It's thing. not going to talk to you about the amount of hydrogen and helium in the sun. Yes. I mean, does that make sense? When I say it's not a scientific account, I mean it doesn't. It doesn't get. It doesn't get told the way we tell stories about science. So it's not a scientific account, and, and so if Christians want to ask scientific questions about how the world is put together, Genesis is not necessarily the place where you take that kind of a, like, how can we be sure about carbon-14 dating? You can't take that question to Genesis. Genesis is not answering that question. If you want to... And not even not answering it because it can't. It's, it's just it's, not. It's, it's just because it's not even it's written not, in a way that even to address that's it. That's not even the point of the story. Yeah. The point of the story is, do you know who you are? Do you know who God is? Do you know where you came from? Do you know where everything came from? Do you know what your relationship is with the, with the creation? Do you know what your relationship is with other human beings? Those are the questions that you take to that scripture, it's, and then it, it answers those questions. It's, it's the fundamental thing of who is God, how powerful is God, and what is then the relationship of the creation to him? So let's talk about questions. When when Jesus handed us the Lord's Prayer, so let's let's if I'm going to ask the question, where's Jesus in that? Let's take it to Jesus. When when people when Jesus handed us the Lord's Prayer, it was in response to a question that had been asked. How should we pray? Right? How should we pray? That was the question. How should we pray? The question was not, what do I do when my dad's a jerk? Yep. The question was not, what, what about those of us who grew up in really bad situations? The question was not, how do I understand myself and my self-esteem when I was beaten as a child? That wasn't the question. The question, and it wasn't even a question of, for an individual, how should I pray? And that's the other thing. When, when he says that this is problem, when this archbishop says that, this is, that our father is problematic for those who had a problematic relationship with their father. He's taking it from the corporate down to the individual level. The question to Jesus was not, how should I pray? Now, there are individual questions that come to Jesus. So the rich young man comes to Jesus and he says, uh, what must I do to be saved, me personally? And then Jesus gives him a very personal answer, sell everything you've got and follow me. After the discussion about keeping the commandments and everything else, but yeah, it's a very right. Personal but it's a very personal interaction. It's a very personal answer. He yep. gives him an answer, not everybody. He didn't tell Warren Buffett to sell all this stuff. 
You know what I mean? He was saying, this is the hang-up I know you've got. He's, this is the hang-up you've got. So you, so if that's Warren Buffett's hang-up, maybe he would have gotten a similar answer. Yep. But the point is, is that it's an individualized response for this man's situation. You have a hang-up with money. Therefore, get rid of it and let go of it and come follow me. So this wasn't a, a, an individual's uh, question. It wasn't, uh, Lord, how should I pray? It was, Lord, how should we pray? It's a corporate the church. It's the church. It's it's believers when they come together as a corporate body, how should we pray? And so then the answer comes, this is how y'all like if you read it in the Greek, it's it's it's, it's y'all in southern. It's you. It's you plural, it's y'all. Yeah. This is a reason why I tell people y'all is a real word and it's very useful. Is, it, is, you it, know, is, it, is it even all y'all? No. That that's Texan. Okay, all right. Like if you're in Tennessee, right. y'all just covered it. Okay. And you all right. don't you don't have all y'all. But anyway. I digress. Well, l- let me get to one in, more thing. But, oh, but ahead, in his but. language, and it's the same in Aramaic. It's it, Aramaic has a has a you plural form as well. So it's when y'all pray, y'all pray this way. It is a corporate prayer meant for the church. And so then you have to ask different questions. If you are going to ask a sociological question, you have to ask the sociological question of how we are in worship together. Now, an archbishop like this then may give an answer and say, well, we have a responsibility as church to care for the psychological needs of the lowest and the weakest. Okay, fine. Maybe that's a way to go about answering the question. But then my question becomes, is that perpetuating a victimhood mindset? Or even from the standpoint, I want to jump to another quote I've got marked here in the article. Which, okay, which well, I like, then jump to it. About... Jesus, you know, yeah. Where's the Jesus in it? And it's a it's a guy that's pushing back against this archbishop, and he says, "Is the archbishop of York saying Jesus was wrong, or that Jesus did not was not pastorally aware in terms of telling the church right. this is how you all should pray? This is how y'all should pray. Pray it's this way. The Jesus, the one who is the Son of God." The God well, made manifest in human flesh, understanding people better than we could possibly ever understand ourselves, not being aware that there's going to be people that struggle and have bad fathers. But I'm still telling you as a church, this is how you should pray. As if, as if he's not completely aware of every single person and how they feel and how they feel about their father. Well, the, uh, that answer is, is talking about the word of God as, as the person of Jesus Christ. So we say that the word of God <laughs> is the Bible, but we mean that as Lutherans in a secondary sense. That it points to Jesus. Yeah, the primary sense of word of God is in the beginning was the word, and that is Jesus. Yep. That's, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. So in, in a primary sense, when Lutherans talk about the word of God, we actually mean the person of Jesus Christ. And so what, what that answer gets to is the idea of asking the archbishop, do you really believe Jesus is the Logos? Do you really believe that Jesus is the Word of God himself made flesh? Or do you not believe that Jesus was just a good teacher? So then, then which then would give you space to question, was he not aware of what our society would look like 2,000 years later? Or what their society would look like. Yeah. You think people just got beat by their daddies now? They got really beat by their daddies back then. I mean, you are you kidding me? Like, they don't... But I'm guessing, well, yes, agreed, and, but to whatever degree, there's a lot more space now to push back and lament against it. Maybe then it was just expected you just take it. Well, I understand that, but the point is, is like, again, Jesus is not aware that, that boys get beat by their father. I yep. mean, and come on. Yep. Or Jesus is not aware... Okay, so this would be one, too. Jesus is not aware that, that uh, people's sexual appetites... Uh, run in a way that could cause real problems for society. He's not aware of that. Whatever this topic is you're you're discussing, to act like Jesus was not aware of it because he lived so long ago. Again, taking it back to creation or science or you know when people when I listen to some Darwinian theorists, uh, they make me laugh because then they say. Well, we don't have a missing link fossil between this species and this species, but we know that they evolved into each other because over the course of billions and billions of years, it's like if you just throw more years at it. Eventually it's going to happen. Eventually it's going to happen. And the same thing happens with with, um, narrow views of history. When you look back at the Roman Empire and what it was like to live as a Jew in the Roman Empire in the first century, and you say... 
well, they lived a long time ago, so they didn't understand stuff. The Roman Empire, by the end, was about 30 years away from, frankly, industrializing. I mean, just look, so, at, their, look at their aqueduct systems and the amount of engineering. I'm not even talking on. about the aqueducts. I'm talking about late model uh, uh, flour mills that turn grain into flour. They were, they were about 30 years away from, from figuring out steam power yep. and industrializing. And we wouldn't get there after the fall of the Roman Empire until like the 1800s. 1,500 so, more years or whatever it is, yeah. So don't tell me that they didn't, I mean, they didn't understand some things that we understand today. But also they just didn't talk the same way because they lived before Freud. You know, when you talk about somebody's psychology and what it did to them to, to grow up in a certain household, you're only, you only talk that way because you live after Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Yes. And the rise of, of psychology as a discipline. And it's okay that we live there, and it's okay that we have a way of talking because of the work of And of there's some things that have come out of that clearly that are super helpful in the terms of pastoral care within a right. congregation or other things about addressing this very reality but, but of act, that he brings but, up. But to act that like Jesus didn't understand that people have problem that men have problematic <laughs> relationships with their fathers or that women have problem, problematic relationships with their fathers because he doesn't talk like Carl Jung that's I mean that's kind of a bridge too far intellectually well, speaking well, well let's 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 take it a step further then yeah there's lots of ways I'm gonna say God's word the Bible mm-hmm. the revealed word as you said yeah that points to Jesus primarily but there's lots of things in the Bible that when you read them if you really read what they say are gonna make you feel uncomfortable and well, so and so what I see here in part then too yeah. is He's saying that as an archbishop of the Church of England, the Anglican Church, the church has a role to somehow protect people from those things that might be uncomfortable. Which seems to me a pretty slippery slope down toward the road of, what? well, let's protect people from telling them that they're sinners. I mean, in I need had the, God's grace. I had this happen. Because that's uncomfortable. Well, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of... Well, if you're going to go the route of taking the divine sharpie to the scriptures and marking through anything you don't like, don't agree with, don't feel comfortable with, that makes you feel uncomfortable... You're you're not going to stop at our Father. No, there's going to be an awful lot of other things that you're gonna that you're gonna. And the, and the question of religion then is is the is the point of religion merely to provide comfort because religion does provide comfort to people, but is the point of religion to provide comfort? Is that the primary role of religion, or is religion uh, a way of trying to help a person to face the truth? Yeah, and if the if the point of religion is to help somebody face the truth, which ultimately truth is a person. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. The truth is a person, Jesus Christ. So if the point of religion ultimately is to help you to face the truth. Where do you stand before him? Then sometimes the truth will provide comfort and sometimes the truth will make you extremely uncomfortable. But the truth will always end up setting you free at the end. Yes. But it it may be uncomfortable until we get to the point of freedom. Versus the other side of that, which makes me think of what you said before, I don't know about on this podcast, but looking at religion as moral therapeutic de- deism. That, yeah. That God is the one that's going to help. Or what you just said it. about the church's job, the leadership of the church, their job is to protect people from things that are in religion that are uncomfortable. I, I did a <laughs> wedding a couple years ago where another pastor of our synod asked me, I was asked by the couple to read some scriptures, and I, I got the scripture, I don't remember if it was Mark's version or Matthew's version, it was basically get married and stay married and raise little godly rud rats. It was when you know, a man and a woman, the two become one flesh, Jesus is teaching this, he says a man and a woman become one flesh, therefore it's not lawful to get divorced. He's pointing out divorce is wrong. Right, he's pointing out that divorce is wrong. And then this pastor of our synod came up to me, and I don't know if he's still serving or if he's retired, but he's an older guy. And he came up to me afterwards, and he uh, actually called me on the telephone, and he said, I, I want you to not read the part where he talks about divorce. Just read the part where he talks about how important marriage is. Jesus does. And I said, why do you want me to stop before Jesus teaches about divorce? In a we- it's a wedding. I mean, we got to talk about all the options, you know, <laughs> stay married, get divorced. We got to talk about that at a wedding. And he, 50% of marriages ended. Divorce. Right. Let's, so we, let's, we should probably bring it up. Acknowledge it. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, uh, this guy said, well, because, uh, one of the 
persons that was being married, their parents had gone through a divorce. It was very messy. It was very painful. And that he knew this family for a long time. He was their pastor for a long time. And he worked with them through all that guilt and all that shame and all that pain. And he didn't want the reading of this. This is the Our Father business. Mm -hmm. He didn't want the reading of this in a Christian worship service, a corporate worship service, to make that couple feel uncomfortable. So he wanted me to, to leave it out. And I said... Look, I, I, I love you, brother, but I'm not going to censor or muzzle Jesus. I mean, he's, if we're going to start to muzzle the, the Savior, we're, we're going down a, a dangerous path. I, Jesus said it. He gets to say it. He gets to be Jesus, and I'm going to read it. And well, that's the end of the... Well, let's go a little further even with that example. You don't want to muzzle the words of Jesus. Here's what we have passed down to us that are the revealed word of God that are Jesus' words, in fact, directly in that spot, whether it's which account it gives, Matthew or Mark, but why would you want to muzzle the words of Jesus? Granted, in addition to that, and I'm guessing at this wedding you probably preached, Yeah, maybe taking that into account in terms of how you might unpack how you talk about divorce right. in a pastoral care the, kind of way to not preach in a way that might cause hurt to that family. You'd want to maybe take that into account you can try. I mean, I so we went we went home, and my family's mostly Baptist, so uh, we went to Baptist church, and uh, we've been exposing Mari as she gets older to different traditions. So we took her to an Eastern Orthodox worship service, mm-hmm. Divine Liturgy, and I said, okay, and then we went for coffee and donuts, and we we debrief. We well, let's like, unpack okay. it a little bit. What's yeah. different? So what you see? What's the same? Yeah. What's different? What, what confused you? Then we went to Roman Catholic Mass. We went to St. Cecilia's over in Omaha. Mm-hmm. Beautiful old cathedral founded by Spanish immigrants to this area. And so a uh, great example of, of Mass and, and what that liturgy can look like. And then we went for coffee and donuts. So you, you notice the pattern here? It's very Lutheran. We always go for coffee and donuts. So anyway, so we went for coffee and donuts and we debriefed about that. And I said, well, this is going to be a great example because we're going home to Nashville and with my family, and most of them are Baptists or they're not believers at all. That's the family I come from. So we can go see a Baptist worship service because you hadn't seen that yet. And mm-hmm. it's a real Southern Baptist worship with the <laughs> amen and the, at one and point. I, I've been, and it's a lot of fun. At one, it's, it's, I've, fu- it's I've funny. I've been to Houston one time. And it's, yeah, but. it's funny. I may be a Southern boy. My wife may be Brazilian, but we're definitely raising a uh, little Midwestern Lutheran because she's grown up here in Lincoln. So at one point in the service, my mother is sitting to my right, stands and starts crying in the middle of the service. She's standing in the pew like this with her arms up and she's crying. And and Mario comes up, like leans over to me and whispers like, what's wrong with Nana? And I said, nothing. This is just Baptist worship. She's just getting it all off her chest. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's part of it. I said, she'll come back next week and cry again. It's okay. <laughs> you know? so it's just real emotional. You got you to put it out there. You got to get it out there. And so uh, that was a fun experience for us. Uh, but the sermon time rolled around, and the pastor started saying some things about some of the stuff that's going on in the culture today. So he talked about LGBT issues and, and stuff like that. And... Um, Afterwards, Mari said, well, Dad, that you and that preacher agree on a lot of things when it comes to some of these cultural issues. Mm-hmm. She didn't say cultural issues because she's 11, but that's what she meant when it comes to some of these cultural issues. But she said, but he says it a lot more forcefully than you do. Yeah. And I said, well, honey, that's because he's a Southern Baptist pastor in the middle of a conservative Southern Baptist congregation in the middle of Nashville, Tennessee. He can say it that way. But would it surprise you to know that a lot of our people at Faith back in Lincoln will come through the doors and shake my hand after a service and say, Pastor, I just love when you just tell it like it is. So in other words, from a pastoral care perspective, if I'm being careful to unpack things in a way to where you'll let me tell you the truth, but you won't run from me, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, if I'm trying to be gentle in my approach as a pastor in the pulpit, I said, to my daughter I said honey so what's funny is as gentle as I'm trying to be with a bunch of Midwesterners they have a different culture than Southerners do they don't like that truth just right in the face like that they that they, they think that's rude and distasteful well and, and you've been teaching me this way too and right? and yeah. so I said so as as gentle as I am with them they hear me as telling yeah. them the truth in a really straightforward way just as direct as 
what the Dallas right. preacher that and it, and, it, and it makes me giggle because I'm like, if y'all think this is hard to listen to, you ought to hear me if I really told you what I thought. You know what I mean? Because because I grew up in a tradition because I grew up southern. Baptist, I grew up in a tradition in the South where you just go ahead and just say it, just say it. Yep. I don't do that as a Lutheran pastor because to your to your point about okay, the scriptures say what they say. I have the discretion as a preacher to couch that truth in a way that hopefully doesn't make you mentally turn off and run from me, but instead a way that draws you in where I can still give you the truth. Well, and it's the, it's, it is the plain truth, but it's in a way that doesn't, that, that like I'm not coming at you with an ax, like an ax murder. Does well, that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And this is about a year ago. Yeah. And I'm still learning how to preach, all those kinds of things you're helping teach me. Yeah. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but it was about a year ago-ish. I don't remember exactly the time frame. I've slept since then, man. Yeah. So yeah. I don't, yeah. But I decided to preach about one of the mass shootings that happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I remember that I ran yeah. it by you. I ran it by my wife. Right. I wanted people to hear it for right. the exact reason of, I want to talk about this issue. Right. But I don't want to say something five minutes into my sermon that shuts somebody off and then they're not hearing anything else because they heard the one thing. Right. Because it's so emotional, so whatever the, the circumstances are that might be analogous to, I had a father that was abusive and this... This, right. this is a struggle for me that you don't hear the rest of what it's saying in a sermon. Because at the end of the day, this archbishop is not trying to get rid of the words, Our Father. He's trying to get rid of the concept of Our Father. Yes. And I think that's what's most problematic about it. So I was sitting looking on my phone, too. And yeah, so you were looking up something. What did you I was mean? looking up Second Timothy. I just okay. want to make sure I said it right. This yeah. is Second Timothy 4. And, it, and for me, this is... You tell me what you think, too. But this, this kind of becomes then, how do you thread this needle between speaking the truth and sticking to the truth, which is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Whether that's in his revealed word or looking at him and understanding that he really is God himself, the word made man. And he died and he rose. Yeah. And, yeah. and all those things that you said eventually you're going to face the way, the truth of life. You're going to face Jesus. Mm -hmm. And there's consequences to that. Right. Either receiving the grace he's given, judgment, etc., all that. But <clears throat> this is Second Timothy 4 in Paul's words, and he says, For the time is coming... When people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth mm -hmm. and wander off into myths. Yeah. And so then the, the point of wanting to be able to be cognizant of getting back to the example here, mm -hmm. somebody could have had an abusive father. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard and that's really hurtful. And it's there's a lot of emotion with it. There's a lot of hurt with it. There's a lot of a whole bunch of different things. Right. So there's, a lot, the there's a lot of, to work through. From the standpoint of trying to provide good pastoral care, you want to be cognizant of those kinds of things, but not in a way to the point that you're willing to stray from sound teaching and well, stray from the truth and of what's, Jesus. What's, what's the antidote to a bad father? No father? Yeah. Maybe the antidote to a bad father is a good father who actually loves you. You know, I had a very good father. And I don't want the next thing that I say to be misconstrued by anybody. I had a very good father, and I love my dad, and he taught me an awful lot, and he was very good, and he was very good to me, and he took care of me, and he provided for me, and he gave me a leg up in life. I had a very good father, and I had a good relationship with him. Here's the thing. I cannot conceive of my heavenly father the same way that I conceive of Ricky Miller. Because Ricky Miller falls very short of, as good as he loved me, as well as he loved me, he falls short of the kind of love that I experience at the hands of my Heavenly Father. And so, even if you had a good father, the analogy of father is only going to carry you so far until you have to start asking different questions of, what does it really mean that God is my heavenly Father? Our Father who art in heaven, not the earthly one that I grew up with. Who, who never sleeps, never slumbers, always is there to give you everything you need for this daily body and life. I mean, the right. fact that his love is so steadfast, so big, so awesome, so always there. I mean, you talk about fathers, and you, you know this about my dad too, but I had a really good dad. Right. But I also had a really good dad who eventually got sick and then couldn't be a really good dad anymore. Right. So in a sense, I got... You got two dads. Two, two sides. Two experiences of, yeah. of, a, of a dad. Yeah. And it wasn't his fault, but yeah. it's at the same time I got to experience 
years of my well, but even, life where he, even he the was years, not the dad that he was when I was younger. Even the years where he was the dad that you remember as a young man. And yep. You can't tell me that he measures up to God. You know what I mean? Agreed. Like, so, you know, you can talk about how people's first experiences of, of a parent are how they start to relate to God. But if that's where it ends for you, then you're spiritually immature. Because the, the reality is that even if you have a good dad, you will have to start to square with this idea of what does it mean that God is my heavenly father? And that he's my father who is in heaven and not the one on earth. Because Jesus doesn't just say our father. He says our father who art in heaven. Those words are chosen intentionally. And so he's trying to teach us something about who God is by giving us, first of all, an analogy like a father, but then not the one you're thinking of. It's our father who art in heaven. And so to remove the, the concept of, of father from the prayer, it's not just an argument over semantics. It's, pro it's problematic and frankly heretical because what it does is it replaces a bad father with no father instead of replacing a bad father or even a good father with what it means that God is our father, which is something even better than even a good earthly father. Jesus said, if you don't love me more than you love father, mother, brother, sister, auntie, uncle, whoever, then you're not worthy of me. There's a point at which the analogy with earthly relationships breaks down because the relationship we have with our God, I'm getting goosebumps right now, is, is of such a different order in terms of his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his self-sacrificial nature, all of this in a way that even a good father can only ever approximate maybe on a good day. Yep. And it's like, to so the antidote to the, the father you had is the actual father in heaven, not to get rid of the concept of fathers. So, which, which even as you say all that takes us all the way back to Genesis again of God is God and we are not. Mm -hmm. God is the creator. We are his creatures. Right. In utter need of him every day. Yeah. But he pours into us every single day. And let alone even Genesis, so many different examples through scripture where God demonstrates his love, demonstrates his mercy, demonstrates mm -hmm. how big it is. Certainly to the point of the ultimate point of sending Jesus to die and rise again mm -hmm. to save us something clearly neither of I don't care how good your earthly father is could never possibly do right and so that's uh, although I, I sympathize on some like I'm trying to put the I'm trying to follow the eighth commandment put the best construction <laughs> on this I'm trying to sympathize with this archbishop I think at the end of the day this is, this is an example of the disease that's creeping into Western churches, including churches in the United States, mm -hmm. where we're taking sort of a pop psychology approach to all of life and to what the nature of truth is. And then we try to protect people from what's difficult about religion. The same would be true of psychology. A counselor that, that protects you from what's difficult about your own psychology is not a good counselor. A good counselor is one that makes you confront what's difficult in your own psychology. And a good pastor is one that causes the congregation to have to confront what may be difficult or problematic within religion itself. Because ultimately, Religion, in a Christian sense, is only good if it points to the person and work of Jesus Christ. Anything else other than that is really worthless. And I could have gotten that from somewhere. I could have gotten what this guy's saying at a at a bad counselor's office who just tried to mollycoddle me, or just some bad seminar in Vegas that some new. Yeah, I mean, I could I could have like YouTube to, that. Yeah. I could have YouTube that. I don't need to go to church for that. I can, I, you know. Which then again gets me back to. Paul's writing to Timothy, and is it ways that your itching ears are looking for something else? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Rather than, yeah. is it ways that you're actually, like you said, digging deep sometimes into the struggles of life, and how even in those struggles of life, there are ways that can point us and turn us back to Jesus? Yeah, and, and ultimately, Jesus taught us as church to pray our Father for a reason. It wasn't 
It wasn't just he, oh, well, somebody just asked me a question. Let me just answer off the cuff here. <laughs> he's, not, he's not a politician. He doesn't do that. And, and, I mean, clearly he's not a politician. The politician's put him to death. You know what I mean? So he's clearly not because a politician. Because he said the really hard things out loud. He said, it, he said it out loud, and nobody wanted to hear it. And so one of the things he said out loud that people may struggle with, and they really may, is, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, not my name. Yeah. And, and learning how to pray that as church is integral to what it means to understand one's identity as a, a as a Christian and as a member of the body of Christ. So I think I think we'll stick with our Father who art in heaven, and we'll Absolutely. let this Anglican dude be a parody of himself and wind up on a Simpsons episode. <laughs> I mean, that's where ultimately uh, religious leaders like this end up. They end up on a Simpsons episode. So. Well, hey, uh, glad to be back with all of you. Uh, if you're tuning in, uh, thanks for spending some time with us, and we'll catch you next time.